Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Putan Vital Jitesh. I'm an associate professor uh, and program coordinator for the genomics and precision medicine with the College of Health and Life Sciences at uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha, Qatar. I'm going to talk about the um, population scale genomics data and uh, the relation with pharmacogenomics. Pharmacogenomics, as you know, is the study of how genes affect an individual's response to medications. Um, we know that uh, not all patients taking the same medication will have the same effect. Some will have the desired effect, um, while others will have adverse effects or somewhere in between. One of the reasons for this variation is genetics. Um, thus, the aim of pharmacogenomics is to provide effective and safe medications in the correct dose based on the person's genetic makeup. This word pharmacogenomics comes from two words, pharmacology, which is the study of drugs, and genomics, which is the study of genes and their functions using technology such as genome sequencing. When we talk about genome sequencing, um, the first thing that comes to mind is the first effort to do the complete human genome sequencing. This took the uh, large scale efforts of hundreds of um, researchers using hundreds of sequencing machines in various labs across the world, um, spending about 13 years and approximately um, 3 billion US dollars. So the, the, the technology has evolved since then from the capillary sequencing to what are termed as next generation sequencing and beyond. So with the introduction of these new technologies, um, sequencing is also getting cheaper and cheaper. So the cost of sequencing a full human genome has come down from millions of dollars um, in the early 2000s um, to a few hundred dollars currently. So such reduction in the cost of um, sequencing has opened up opportunities for large-scale genome sequencing projects, um, sometimes focusing on healthy individual populations or sometimes on patients with certain disorders. Uh, since the human genome sequencing was an effort to find the common reference genome uh, for the humans, the Thousand Genomes Project uh, was an effort to find out how individuals from different populations or ethnicities vary from this uh, reference genome. Um, another project um, called NOMAD has released over 75,000 whole genomes from individuals with various types of diseases and ethnicities and populations. Um, similarly, the UK Biobank has recently released the whole genome sequencing data from um, close to half a million uh, individuals. So there are there has been uh, projects that span small regions such as the Sardinia or uh, populations such as the Icelandic population or even continents such as the Asian Genomes Project. Um, here I am showing the, the map of currently active government-funded national genome medicine initiatives. Uh, well, this is a, it's a bit old in, from 2018. Um, still, you can see that there are several initiatives across the globe, such as the Genomics England 100,000 Genomes Project, focusing on genome sequencing of um, a large number of patients to understand the cause of rare diseases and cancer. Uh, when such large, um, large amount of genomic data is generated, um, irres irrespective of their original intention, uh, such data becomes valuable for studying uh, other aspects, such as pharmacogenomics. Um, that will be pharmacogenomics at the population level. It is then possible to understand how genetic variants that affect response to medications are distributed in populations across the world. This is important since uh, decision makers can prioritize which genes have to be tested for their populations before prescribing um, certain medications. Um, also, such studies can lead to identification of new variants in certain populations that are more important in drug efficacy or adverse um, effects in that population. 
So um, thus the generation of these uh, large scale um, genome data has lifted the field of pharmacogenetics to pharmacogenomics. Ph so, so pharmacogenetics was the, the predecessor of pharmacogenomics when the focus was on single variants or single genes. Now we can study uh, many variants and many genes that affect response to drugs. Such variants may have only a very small effect, but these are additive effects. Um, and uh, they are important in contributing to the final phenotype of response. Whether um, The response is something like um, metabolizer status or um, an adverse reaction or something like that. Before I talk about the population pharmacogenomics, um, it will be good to, to clarify the usage of some of the, the terms that I will use. You may already know these terms, um, but I think it will be in, important to, to um, understand the usage of these in terms of the, the pharmacogenomics, population pharmacogenomics um, that I'm going to discuss. For example, um, allele will refer to a genetic variant uh, at a locus. Um, here you can see a variant um, guanine to adenine substitution, um, G2A, in the promoter region of VKORC1 gene, which is important for response to warfarin. Um, then there is genotype. When we talk about uh, genotypes, um, these refer to the variants on both the homologous chromosomes um, at a specific locus. Um, for example, the homozygous um, AA genotype and the heterozygous GA genotype, um, these, are, um, the, the, these are actually important in terms of VKORC1 um, dosage. Um, then normally a haplotype is defined as a, as a group of alleles on the same chromosome inherited together from a parent. Um, in pharmacogenomics, we use a term called star alleles. Um, these are haplotypes or haplotype patterns at the gene level that are usually associated with protein activity levels. Uh, these are so-called because we use an asterisk or a star and a number of a number to represent the specific combination of variants uh, in a gene that will produce an effect on the protein. Um, star alleles are therefore important when we consider highly polymorphic genes. Um, examples um, are the cytochrome P450 genes or SIPs. Um, because based on these uh, star alleles or variant combinations, the enzyme produced may be less effective or more. Um, if the specific enzyme is involved um, in the metabolism of a drug, then the person may, may become a poor metabolizer or a rapid metabolizer um, or somewhere in between or some, like an intermediate metabolizer, depending on the star allele. Okay, then, then there is the diplotype, which is a matched pair of haplotypes or star alleles um, on homologous chromosomes. And the phenotype, uh, when we talk about pharmacogenomics, will be uh, observable changes in drug response. So as I mentioned, like poor metabolism. Sometimes it may be um, an adverse effect such as uh, myopathy or muscle weakening. Uh, it can be a hypersensitivity reaction. So I give here some example, um, CYP2C9 uh, gene here. Um, when you have a combination of these spliced effect um, in exon 3 and another one in 5 and exon 7, there is a missense variation. So all these contribute to what is called star 2, which leads to a no function protein or the, uh, the, the protein is not functioning as it should be. Um, whereas if you have a different set of variants, it leads to star 11, which can lead, have a normal function. So these are the star alleles or haplotypes. And then you have, um, say, star 2, star 2, like considering both the homologous chromosomes. Then it becomes the, a poor metabolizer. Um, so the star 11, star 11 can be a, a normal metabolizer like that. 
if you want to study um, population level pharmacogenomics from uh, genomic data, of course, genomic data need to be processed and standard processing uh, methods are available, like starting from the row sequencing data, um, which is usually represented in, a, represented in a format called FASTQ. So you can have um, the aligned, uh, this can be aligned to a reference that will lead to the aligned sequences, which are usually represented in a binary alignment or mapping format or BAM. And from these, um, you can identify the alleles which are different from the reference, or these are the variants in a variant calling format or VCF. So what we did is to look at these VCF files coming from multi, uh, multiple individuals or like in a population study um, and filtering those based on the quality. And then we extracted set the gene specific variants, genes which are important in response to drugs. Uh, which we obtained from farm GKB and, uh, and and farm var, which provides a mapping of these uh, variants to star alleles. And then we looked at all possible haplotypes or the star alleles from. So this program, this we, we wrote this in a, this is a Python tool that we uh, developed. This can actually generate these all star allele combinations and also the pairing to produce the diplotypes. And when we look at the uh, matching diplotypes, we can compare it to the uh, phenotypic or um, information coming from um, CPIC or Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium that provides information about how these genotypes or diplotypes are associated with specific response. So we can produce um, a gene-wise report or a drug-wise report or a phenotype-wise report. So what we did is to um, use such a tool to study the pharmacogenomics landscape of the Qatari population. So this will, uh, I'm giving this as an example of how you can use genomic data from say whole genome sequencing uh, coming from large population scale projects to um, understand the pharmacogenetics or landscape of the pharmacogenomics uh, variants in a specific population. So in this study, what we looked at uh, was 6,200 plus uh, samples, which coming from the Qatar Biobank. These are, these are from an observational cohort of um, adult Qataris. We looked at the, um, the, the data that is available are, in addition to whole genome sequencing data, the age, sex, anthropometric measurements, self-reported questionnaires uh, on health conditions, lifestyle, diet, medications, etc., then, uh, as I mentioned, there is whole genome sequencing data that's coming from the Qatar Genome Program on these samples. So, which was um, then we were able to to identify single nucleotide variants, insertion, deletions, copy number variants, structural variants from this data. And after the quality control filtering, we used six thousand forty five samples for further analysis. And the Qatari, uh, the genome sequencing data was further used to identify the population structure within this um, Qatari population. So we identified the Qatari subpopulations. Now this Qatar genome project has um, the, sequenced more than 31,000 um, whole genomes. But we, in this study, we have, look, we have looked at a pilot um, data set of uh, 6,000 plus genomes. Um, the first thing that we looked at uh, is how the pharmacogenetic variants, known pharmacogenetics variants, um, are distributed in the Qatari population. So first we looked at um, farm GKB and identified all the variants known to be associated with drug response. Um, these were like more than 2,600 uh, variants in uh, more than 1,000 genes that are known to affect more than 550 drugs or class of drugs. Um, then we saw that um, the allele frequencies of more than 1300 variants in more than 700 genes affecting close to 300 drugs or class of drugs were significantly different between the Qatari population and the other populations, other world populations, which are present in the NOMAD data sets. So they, we looked at uh, more than 76,000 whole genomes. And uh, the Qatari population, we looked at 6,000 um, 6, plus uh, whole genomes. And the uh, out of these, 
615 variants were found to have higher frequencies in the Qatari population. Of course, these doesn't make much sense when you are, when you are looking at um, large number of variants, large number of genes, how they are different in different populations. But what would be more important or uh, important in terms of clinical relevance would be to look at actionable pharmacogenomics variants. So as I mentioned earlier, um, it is possible to identify these star alleles or haplotypes mapping from highly polymorphic genes um, using the pharmacogene variation of the FarmVar consortium data set. I've given a small example here actually, how star one is defined from various positions in the case of CYP2C19 uh, gene. So this is a small part of a, a large table. So I, um, I'm only showing a small part here actually. And then different star alleles will have a different combinations of these variants. So once we have these haplotypes or star alleles defined, then we looked at um, the diplotypes, of course, um, from the two homologous chromosomes, and how these diplotypes can be mapped to the phenotype. Um, here you can see a table from the um, CPIC, Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, which they provide um, how these star, um, the diplotypes, are mapped to metabolizer status in the case of this uh, CYP2C19 gene. Um, you can see that some of them are normal metabolizers, some are intermediate metabolizers, and this again is a small portion of a big table. So there are other combinations or diplotypes which will lead to poor metabolizer status or rapid metabolizer status or um, ultra rapid metabolizer. Um, one important uh, thing that is provided by the CPIC is to um, define what would be the priority or, or the, uh, the risk of identifying this um, diplotype in a specific individual. So if uh, a, a patient has star one, star one diplotype for CYP2C19, they are CYP2C19 normal metabolizer and they will have a, a normal or, or a low risk uh, when they are taking C2, uh, drugs that are metabolized by CYP2C19 enzyme. But it, but they have, if they have star 1, star 2, they are intermediate metabolizer, so, which means they have high risk. So a, a, the, there has to be a priority set in the electronic health records uh, to say that this patient uh, is at high risk of um, having some... Um, differential effect efficacy of the drug, or maybe maybe sometimes an adverse reaction to that specific drug because of because they are CYP2C19 um, intermediate metabolizer. So this way we can actually define which diplotypes or genotypes uh, lead to high risk. Um, and when we consider all these high risk diplotypes, we call them uh, actionable diplotypes. Okay, so now uh, when we looked at the actionable diplotypes and genotypes in the Qatari population compared to other populations, um, when in the Qatari population on an average, um, there is 3.6 actionable genotypes or diplotypes affecting 13 drugs with such guidelines for clinic clinical implementation. So, which means actually 99.5% um, of the individuals we studied had at least one clinically actionable genotype or diplotype. Okay, and then we, when we looked at um, actionable genotypes or actionable phenotypes, you can see that um, the, com the comparison here is Qatar, Qatar genome program data versus the thousand genomes data. You can see that um, statistically significant difference in, is seen in terms of the uh, the pharmacogen genes such as CYP2B6 or CYP3A5, CYP2C9, VKORC1, and, and so many other um, genes. This is true with when we compare with the thousand genome European population, specifically the European population, not just the the whole um, data set. Still, you see that there is quite a lot of um, and the, there is substantial difference in uh, difference in the distribution or, or the frequencies, diplotype frequencies, in the Qatari population. And for example, if you take the case of um, CYP2C19, um, there is like 
32% of were like rapid or ultra rapid metabolizers or, or 2% were poor metabolizers. So we also looked at the difference in frequency um, among the Qatari subpopulations as well as the thousand genomes uh, superpopulations for all these different genes. As you can see that there is a wide uh, difference in distribution of these uh, frequencies. Even uh, when we looked at the Qatar genome data itself, as I mentioned, actually we had identified different subpopulation within the Qatar genome data. Um, we, if we look at the close ones, like the general Arabs and the peninsular Arabs, peninsular Arabs being the ones which are from the Qatari Peninsula and the general Arabs from the wider Arab region, you can still see that some of the genes have difference in uh, distribution or difference in frequencies, uh, like for example, CYP2B6 um, or CYP2C19. So still there is a difference. Now, if you look at um, the a specific gene, SLCO1B1, which is the, the solute carrier organic anion transporter family member uh, 1B1 gene, this encodes for uh, a membrane bound sodium independent organic anion transporter protein called OATP1B1. Um, this is involved in active cellular influx of many endogenous and uh, um, exogenous uh, xenobiotic compounds, um, including HMG coenzyme A um, reductase inhibitors, which are commonly called as statins. Um, examples, uh, simvastatin or uh, atorvastatin, rosuvastatin. Um, SLCO1B1 gene uh, spans about uh, 15 exons and Normally, there are like around 190 like common variants in in the uh, in this gene with uh, minor allele frequency greater than five percent. That's been identified in this gene. Now, if you look at SLCO1B1, um, there is um, there is a lot of effect in terms of some of these statins because it's it's a major transporter for statins, and especially this is true for simvastatin, which is a widely used um, cholesterol um, lowering drug and variants in SLCO1B1 gene can therefore lead to adverse drug reactions um, such as skeletal muscle toxicity, mainly myopathy or muscle degradation. As you can see from these tables, um, some combinations of these diploid types or like star 1A, star 1A, um, these are actually producing a normal phenotype, normal function, whereas you have the star 5, star 5, uh, or star 15, star 15, these produce low function. And when you look at these uh, different combinations, um, the normal function one will have a normal myopathy risk, but then the low function uh, diplotypes can lead to a high myopathy risk and the intermediate function ones can have an intermediate myopathy risk. So both of these, like the intermediate myopathy risk and the high myopathy risk ones, um, the low function and the intermediate function are actually actionable in terms of um, clinical implementation. So when we looked at the distribution of these uh, diplotypes in the Qatari population, um, we, we identified close to 60 different diplotypes in the Qatari population. And as you can see from this plot, there is like a wide uh, distribution of these frequencies in the Qatari subpopulations as well. Um, you can see that um, the, there are some poor metabolizers, sorry, some poor function um, phenotypes produced by these the diplotypes, some with uh, decreased function and um, several with uh, normal function. When you look at the actionable frequency that, that is considering both the poor function and the decreased function diplotypes, um, we can, you can see that the QGP, within the QGP data, there is 40% um, of the peninsular Arabs are actually having a diplotype which leads to an actionable phenotype. 
and and uh, the Qatari general Arabs being the the second uh, in that respect. Um, in fact, the when we compared with other world populations, this frequency was actually double uh, in the Qatari population compared to other world populations. Which means actually it's very important to study SLCO1B1 or genotype uh, or produce the diplotypes of SLCO1B1 before giving um, statins, especially simvastatin, in the Qatari population. Next, I will give one more example here, warfarin, which is commonly used um, oral anticoagulant worldwide, um, used for venous thromboembolism, atrial fibrillation, and, and such conditions. The problem with uh, warfarin is its narrow therapeutic range, uh, which can lead to adverse drug reactions. If the uh, dosage is lower, it can uh, lead to increased uh, stroke risk. And if it is high, it can lead to increased intracranial uh, hemorrhage. Um, the warfarin is, is a racemic mixture of R and S stereoisomers. The S warfarin is more potent than the R warfarin, and it is met metabolized by mainly by CYP2C9, uh, the enzyme which produces the hydroxyl metabolites. And uh, warfarin exerts its um, anticoagulant effect through the inhibition of its molecular target, which is VKORC1, um, which in turn limits the availability of the reduced vitamin K, leading to decreased formation of functionally active clotting factors. So these are the main uh, genes involved. Of course, you can see that there are other in genes involved, CYP4F2, GGCX, um, CALU, all these are also all these can also produce some effect if there are variants in these genes that can um, lead to some um, that will lead to a change in the dosage of warfarin. So when we looked at the uh, frequency of VKORC1 actionable genotypes in the Qatari population, we see that it's very high. There is especially in the general Arab Peninsula Arab population, it is um, close to eighty percent. Um, and this is also high compared to other world population. Similarly, the CYP2C9 actionable diplotypes in the population, there were um, several normal um, individuals, but there were uh, individuals with um, poor and intermediate uh, metabolizer um, phenotypes as well. Now, for warfarin dosing, there is a clear uh, clinical guidelines available. Um, for example, um, the CPIC has provided this um, kind of uh, a flow chart where, so if VKORC1 and CYP2C9 star 2 and star 3 genotypes are available, and if the, they are, the patient is identified as non-African ancestry, if they are self-identified as a non-African ancestry, then there is strong evidence to say that VKORC1, um, this promoter uh, variant, and CYP2C9 star 2 star 3 um, information can be used to calculate the dose based on validated published pharmacogenetic algorithms. There are such algorithms available which can use, I can, I, which I show on the right side here, which uses age, sex, race, weight, height, and so many other parameters, which can also include CYP2C9 genotype, uh, VKORC1 genotype, and also sometimes some of the algorithms can include other um, genes um, as well, CYP4, F2, and GGCX. So when we looked at, um, uh, of course, in this guideline, there is the other half which says if it is African ancestry, then there are certain other specific diplotypes of CYP2C9 which are important, like the star 5, star 6, star 8, and star 11. Um, so so it is very important to understand which specific haplotypes or, or star alleles or diplotypes of CYP2C9 and also the VKORC1 genotypes are present in the population. So if you look at the, the bottom right, when we did this calculation of um, predicted dosage of warfarin, weekly dosage, based on such an algorithm, the uh, International Warfarin Pharmacogenetic Consortium, IWPC, uh, algorithm, then we identified that the Qatari population requires a bit higher dose compared to the European population. Um, 
even though the distribution is, is slightly different in these populations. Okay, so I just wanted to give these two examples to uh, show that the population uh, genomic data can actually provide a lot of insight into the um, clinical pharmacogenetics information. Um, even though the data that was generated um, may be on healthy individuals or the projects may have different um, aims and objectives, still you can use this information, this data. So to summarize, sequencing data from large-scale genomics projects may be used for, for understanding the pharmacogenomic variant distribution in a population or multiple populations. And such studies may reveal important differences in distribution of variants between populations. For example, as I, I've shown, the actionable diplotype frequency of SLC01B1 was more than double in the Qatari population compared to other world populations. So the significance of this is that understanding actionable genotype or diplotype frequencies um, will help in the prioritization of gene drug pairs for clinical implementation. So if a particular population is or, or country is planning to introduce pharmacogenetics in the clinics, then it is possible to prioritize which uh, genes or combinations of gene drug um, can be uh, used or prioritized based on such information. In addition to looking at the population level frequency, when we uh, do this analysis, we also get we also can generate the reports um, for each participant or each individual, and on all these different genes which are important uh, in deciding whether a specific drug can be given to a patient or or, or an individual or dosage need to be adjusted. So that information can be generated in a report. And if this report, if such information is uh, incorporated into electronic health records, um, then such, in, that, such um, information can be used at later stage when they visit the clinics, when the doctor is about to prescribe a medication. So a warning can be uh, issued, an alert can be issued saying that this specific patient should not be prescribed this medication or the dosage need to be changed. So that uh, will lead to a preemptive implementation of pharmacogenomics. Okay, I will stop there and uh, thank uh, all the um, partners, Qatar Biobank, Qatar Genome, Sidra Medicine, Hamad bin Khalifa University, University of Liverpool, and also the uh, large-scale consortiums and, and uh, uh, programs such as Farm GKB, Farm War, CPIC. And of course, all the participants of the Qatar Genome Program and other genome programs whose data provided uh, were used in this analysis. And if you want to know more about this um, work, you can um, look at this publication. Thank you very much.